The following podcast contains mature language and spoilers. Listener discretion is advised. Now, having talked about there being three titles that you need to follow to be a Teen Titans fan, I will make an argument briefly of for a fourth. Part of the New 52 lineup was Static Shock. It was one of the shortest lived books that was released in that initiative. You know, it was a return to the Milestone character popularized by and created by Dwayne McDuffie and Dennis Cowan. I don't think, I don't remember who drew the series. I think John Paul Leone maybe when it first got started. So Static was the most popular of the Milestone characters. Uh, he's the one who moved on to animation with the Static Shock series. So for me, he's golden because that character accomplished something that very few combo characters do, and especially very few characters of color. That having been said, he's also in the Peter Parker school of hero, young heroes with feet of clay and experience. That's never been my bag. Even when I read Spider-Man comic books, it's when he was an older character, veteran essentially, you know, still a bit of a screw up, but more because of his circumstances, because he didn't have the resources of other heroes. He'd been around the block many times i was reading spider-man comic books when he was dating black cat and uh, you know shortly before his marriage to mary jane watson so he was much more of an adult character in that time period where static was clearly you know he's a teenager he's uh i think barely in high school in that series so i didn't read a lot of static and i didn't follow the static shock series but a, a big stumbling point for me was writer artist scott mcdaniel i i've never been a huge fan of his work not because it isn't good i'm not criticizing the work he he has a strong Rick Leonardi influence, and I've never been able to really enjoy Rick Leonardi stuff that much either. It's just not a style that suits me, and I kind of hold it against him too because he was the artist who launched the first Nightwing ongoing series, and he and Chuck Dixon made changes to the Nightwing character, or to some degree didn't make changes to the Nightwing character, and he fell flat to me. It always felt like he was the second or third choice to be written by Chuck Dixon. And, and that they threw a lot of stuff at the character, like having him being a fan of Christian pop and stuff that I felt was very much them imposing their views onto the character. But also, I just thought the book looked shit, and it, he was a poor man's daredevil, and I wasn't into it, either one of the creators on that book, and they stayed for fucking ever. So, whereas I would be an easy mark for a Nightwing series, since that's one of my all-time favorite superhero characters, I ultimately did not follow Nightwing beyond the first, I don't know, less than a year, I think I stayed on there. I kept going back to the well whenever they do something interesting, like a multi-parter, where he's facing off against Deathstroke and such, but it was always with a sense of my arm being pushed behind my back. I was always feeling forced into picking up the book by some circumstance, knowing going in that I wasn't going to enjoy it. And I I didn't, simply put. So to have Scott McDaniel doing Static Shock was already a deal breaker for me. But of course, there was a lot of drama related to that book because John Rosen was supposed to be brought in as a writer, as a guy who had done work at Milestone. I've, to the degree that I've been exposed to John Rosen's work, I've enjoyed it. I think he's one of those interesting, quirky writers. Not necessarily necessarily a commercial one and that ended up being the big problem was that there was another one of those situations very similar to Firestorm where all these guys that used to be Marvel editors uh, who had in the early 90s turned over a lot of the reins of the comics to the artists against the writers and uh, also a strong drive towards editorially driven books that happened with Static Shock and that happened with Firestorm where he was basically the artist and the editor who was deciding everything that was going to happen and the writer was something of an afterthought and writers don't tend to appreciate that. It's one thing if you're brought in solely to do dialogue, uh, which was somewhat the case with Gail Simone on Firestorm, but that was also a situation where she got pushed into a book that she didn't want to do. I think Rosam actually wanted to do this book, but his style of work and the the style of Scott McDaniel and the editor were not compatible. And the book just launched it with low sales. So the two of the people involved with the creation of the book, their sole goal was to make sure to get the sales up higher to make sure the book continued. John Rosen just wanted to tell good stories in the vein of Milestone. Frankly, Milestone was not a huge seller for most of its life either. Uh, but a lot of the regard that Milestone has is for the quality of the work that they put out, the influence that work had, and that that quality and that need for a, a line of that sort played into the creation 
Generation of Static Shock, which is a beloved cartoon series drawing from Dwayne McDuffie's work. And I believe he wrote the series uh, largely as well. So I feel like Rosalind's concern was just honoring the legacy of Dwayne McDuffie, writing the book that in a better world, Dwayne McDuffie would be doing himself. I don't necessarily fault McDaniel and the editor for trying to get sales up since they launched a low point. I will say that part of the reason why they probably launched a low point was that Scott McDaniel was involved and he had not had commercial successes in recent years. And this guy that's, you know, beyond creative integrity, probably needed a hit and wanted to make sure that he was going to be able to continue to work. The main thing I fault, though, is the way in which they tried to go about goosing sales because they did nothing that objectively would help. Their idea was to make it an action-oriented book with lots of shock tactics like chopping off Static's arm and stuff. That's the sort of thing that you can use on a character like Aquaman or, or an iconic character where you deviate heavily or inflict massive damage onto the character and it's going to goose interest because these characters are already interesting or, or there's a desire to see icons get broken, that sort of thing. The obvious course in doing a static book is, okay, where you had a successful cartoon series. The majority of the fan base for the static character, especially the potential fan base, since you're trying to try to grow sales from where they had been, you know, 10, 20 years earlier when you had the milestone line launching, is to make it as close to the cartoon as possible. And then if you want to, you know, shake things up, once you've established the world as it was in the cartoons, you could go from there. Giving him a different costume, having him drawn in a fashion he wasn't used to be drawn in. And uh, according to Rosam, being written by a artist who had never written before, who had never read the comics, who had never watched the TV series, who was treating Static Shock as a blank page, they're not going to do themselves any favors with whatever established fandom Static Shock had by not giving that audience what they were be expecting. But beyond that, looking at the series, it's the mostly the same group of villains for the first six issues. They look like turds. There's nothing special about them. There's nothing that would generate interest based on these people. And you have this repetitive, monotonous fight scenario for the first six issues. So uh, the artist and the editor were essentially relying on big action beats to sell this book. And it's fucking static shock. You know, you're, you're going to need more and you're going to need to cater to the audience that actually exists. And all they were doing is throwing a bunch of action at you. Maybe, maybe that would work with established, more established character, a character that had a, a broader fan base. that was more iconic. Johnny Thunder isn't the most hated Justice Society member, but I would say that he's probably the least liked. A few years back when Ryan Daly was still doing the Secret Origins podcast, he made a joke out of asking you know many people uh, if they would be willing to be his co-host on the Johnny Thunder episode, and we all were mocking him for even asking. Johnny Thunder has this needlessly complicated origin about being kidnapped as an infant and taken to the ridiculously named country of Bodnesia. Ultimately, what it comes down to is that he's a dumb kid who gets a hold of a pen that allows him to access what's essentially a genie, a thunderbolt, pink, grants his wishes. But he's kind of a nimrod, and so he doesn't, to my recollection, even at times know the word he's to say to conjure the genie, and the thunderbolt isn't necessarily given good directions, and he's, he's basically a fuck-up. And the thing of it is, the old Johnny Thunder strips were serial comic, emphasizing the comedy, and having a boob with this extraordinary ability works in that circumstance. The problem is he's part of a shared universe. Um, he tends to be engaged in adventure trips, especially when he's involved with Justice Society of America. And there's just not a to- lot of tolerance for a character like that in that venue. Uh, people read superhero comic books for aspirational characters to live vicariously. Uh, nobody wants to uh, be Forrest Gump with a genie in a bottle. We cannot countenance Johnny Thunder's buffoonery. And see, you look at something like Aladdin, one of the reasons why that works is because the kid's actually a hero. He goes through all these adventures and all these trials to get a hold of the genie. And even getting the genie doesn't solve all of his problems. And I'll be honest with you, I've never actually seen all of the Disney Aladdin movie, but I assume that if Robin Williams is the genie, then probably the genie fucks some stuff up and causes as many problems as he corrects for. And it's probably also significantly limited in what he can do because, again, he ha- you have to rub the lamp and he comes out and he has to be commanded to 
properly. If you go back to the original lore that this is derived from, the Jin, uh, there's a lot of monkey's paw stuff going on where these aren't necessarily beings that want to be acting at your beck and call and try to fuck you over while they're supposedly granting your wishes at the same time. But the Thunderbolt in the DC strips is benign, essentially. So you don't get that dynamic. You don't get to see the hero triumph in spite of the pros and cons of having this genie in his, at his command. Most Thunderbolt stories are about him being a fuck up, stumbling backwards into successes, or he's in the Justice Society stories where he's something of a non-entity because he doesn't have a lot to contribute because people don't want to see him adventuring. Uh, most of the superheroes from the 40s into the 50s lost their strips to the Kid Yang that used to be their buddies or their pets, their dogs, their canine wonders. In the case of Johnny Thunder, he got outshone by Black Canary. And when you have a, a female superheroine at a time when the market still was fairly hostile, that sort of thing, but she still managed to outshine him, that shows the relative favorability rating, the Q rating for Johnny Thunder. And so, of course, that's why he's the one that can get stricken with Alzheimer's and they can play that out when they're showing the aging heroes in the early 90s. He's the one that they can kill off and then turn into the Thunderbolt so that he continues to live on. Since he's not really very useful as a living character, you might as well uh, have him be the Thunderbolt. Again, if you're making that changeover, then, well, let's get some representation. Let's get a black kid in the role. Uh, This is uh, originally, I think he was referred to as JJ Thunder. Um, The allusions to a guy who willingly has conjugal relations with Ann Coulter probably were not helpful. Not wanting to treat a supposed new superhero as though he were a 70s sitcom character. They started referring to him by his proper name of Hakeem. But the problem is you're it's a poison chalice, this legacy, because this isn't a popular character to begin with. It's a power set that isn't very desirable. You know, he's still the guy who activates the thing that actually gets stuff done. And of course, the problem is theoretically a Thunderbolt can be like a Spectre level powerhouse. But for most of the existence, he's tied to uh, Doiby Dickles, essentially, of Doiby Dickles with the Spectre. Uh, With Hakeem, the problem is, is since his genie is the bumbling fool Johnny Thunder, he has that a negative association right there and he's back in the position of being a person who's trying to command this power source to do some good but he probably is a bumblefuck and the DC series especially in a team book it, it just isn't geared for telling that type of story so mostly you end up with the black kid as a token off the side in group shots to say hey we, we got one we've got a black on the team now no racism here You forgot to mention the subtextual slavery element of the genie master dynamic, and how of course when it's transferred to a black kid, he gets the broke-ass ineffectual genie to hobble his heroic efforts, more like Injustice Society of America KKKA. Am I right? And I have to say, as somebody who's spent a fair amount of time on those black superhero websites, there's a pretty conspicuous absence of fan clamoring for the further adventures of Akeem Thunder. Static Shock isn't a shower, it's a grower. You've got to build an audience, and the best way to have a a strong base is to make sure you're serving what that audience is expecting and presenting the most popular conception of that character so that you can build from there. They failed to do that. The mentality of how to generate sales was far off, and what really gets me too is that the book only got eight issues. That's a paltry number of issues, to, especially for a, a launch series out of the New 52, and I understand that that was sales. The sales just weren't there to continue it. But if you've got this Titans line that's mostly written by Scott Lobdell, admittedly, but not exclusively, and you've got this teen hero and you're dragging all these other teen heroes into the orbit of the Teen Titans books and essentially extorting readership of three titles, what's a fourth hurt? Why don't you have Static doing stuff with the Titans? Why isn't he a member of the team even? He had a guest appearance at one point, but nothing substantial. And the good thing about the the Teen Titans relaunch of the New 52 was they at least tried to bring in a broader variety of uh, representation. You had Latinos and gays and Indians and, and black members uh, to replace some of the ones that are were more famous uh, Titans. You know, your Cyborg. I mean, actually, most of 
the Teen Titans were coded ethnic rather than actually ethnic. So it, it, it really is kind of like just cyborg, isn't it? Anyway, uh, Teen Titans was doing a, I, I'd say a fairly admirable job of getting representation in the books. And obviously Teen Titans had an easier time because they had bigger name talent associated with them, even though, let's face it, Scott Labdell's brand was pretty dinged even going into the New 52. You have characters that are more popular and uh, somewhat more iconic, but let, to be honest, the, the Teen Titans out of the New 52 is somewhat off-brand. You've got one of the Robins whose stock had fallen considerably. You've got Wonder Girl, which was an incarnation of that name that was never as broadly embraced as the Donna Troy version. You've got the weird, wonky Superboy that people aren't sure about. But they looked good, and they looked modern, and they did have uh, some traction. They were able to open well and maintain sales through a variety of very 90s-esque means. But I would say that of the New 52 books, Teen Titans is one of the New 52 ists and I think that that was, in the time it was coming out, an asset. It felt new, it felt bold, it felt daring, obviously controversial, obviously alienating, but I do think there was an element of hate reading, too. I think that there was something like what happened with heat uh infamously one of the reasons why green lantern sales climbed in the 90s wasn't just because a bunch of people were interested in kyle rayner and the new direction of the book but because there were all these old hal jordan stands who were hate reading it and attacking every issue as it came out on the message boards but they were still buying it so it's not the most popular method of creating sales but it can be an effective one and i think that that was if successfully deployed on the teen titans book clearly that was not the case with Static Shock. So having a book that was as insular as it was, that did not have any connections to the other New 52 titles, you're not getting Static uh, into the, the Teen Titans, which would have been beneficial more for Static than the Titans. But I think that that would have been a very visual example of uh, inclusion and representation. Titans had some, but it could have used more and it could have been mutually beneficial. But you had eight issues of Static Shock. Uh, John Rosen only hung around for four. There was a very public meltdown between specifically Rosam and Scott McDaniel where they were both having competing stories about who was in the right and who was in the wrong after the book had been cancelled most people forget that Mark Bernardin was brought in for the last two issues and actually if you look at those last two issues that, that felt more like the static book that people would have wanted to get but obviously it was too little too late and it's just sad that Bernardin came in and he was listed as the full writer on those last two issues where all the previous issues were driven by Scott McDaniel and it's just really too bad that you only got two issues of a book that looked more more like what people wanted from Static, and that Bernard was denied the opportunity to do more material because he only got those two lousy issues and didn't get a lot more work from DC after the fact. I think he deserved better, and I think Static Shock deserved better. That's why in the context of the Who's Editing Challenge, uh, I throw Johnny Thunder under the bus. There are several uh, stories laced through the narrative uh, where we're looking at abuses within the power structures of the superheroes. I deal with that a lot with the New God stuff. I figured to probably play with it some with Justice Society as well. But, you know, I have a love for those characters and, and a lot of people do. And so the, the most obvious person, if you're going to have somebody turn out to be, you know, a Cosby style molester. Johnny Thunder because nobody's going to rise up in his defense. Nobody's going to be heart sick at the thought of that. And I'd already tried to do the thing with the White Canary character where she was going to absorb a lot of the history of the mid-60s Wonder Woman, depowered Wonder Woman. Uh, and I was also going to have her absorb some of the history of the original Batwoman, the 1950s Kathy Kane, not realizing that that character had been resurrected. But since White Canary ex essentially existed because there was a TV show where they miscast Black Canary and then did a corrective action and the new version of Black Canary is more popular and so they had to turn her into something to validate her continued existence so she became the White Canary and they had her tied up with the League of Assassins and she wears white where her sister wears black and yada yada. There's not a lot to the character it's mostly down to the actress's performance problematic actress by the way I don't watch those shows but uh, you know hey, I like her on Mad Men and she does a good job in the role. Not a lot of crossover into the DC comics but I think that there is a place for White Canary when, within the DC universe because I, you know I'm, a, I'm a, a subscriber to Scipio Garland's theory of dynastic centerpieces. If you're going to have a DC hero who's going to have real resonance, that hero needs to have an expanded family to support them and to show you know how they are a legacy worth building upon. And really, so far, Black Canary's legacy has been the Birds of Prey, 
She adopted a little Asian girl named Sin for a while there, and then that character just sort of vanished. Uh, she had a, a love interest uh, at times, but that usually doesn't pan out. So really, the legacy of Black Canary is the Birds of Prey, but she's just a member of a team in that circumstance, and that team has gone on without her at various points in time. So if you're ever going to have Black Canary be a, a character that's a real contender, it's somebody who can actually be one of the forefronted DC heroines, then you're going to need to expand her family to show her importance and having this sister even though there's a sister that really mucks up the continuity of the comic books she's shown some popularity she's shown some staying power she's crossed over into or originated within multimedia just in the same way that Batgirl did at least the Barbara Gordon version so you might as well lean into that and take advantage of the gift that was landed in your lap Uh, but in my case because the whole point of doing the White Canary series was to play around with Wonder Woman lore and Kathy Kane lore but also to reflect the new 52 and recognize that that material had already been used for other characters. I didn't really know necessarily what to do with White Canary. Also, there wasn't a lot of artwork out there for me to mix into the solicitations. Uh, so mostly, I just used it as a vehicle to tell stories for the bigger League of Assassins thing that I was doing and to drag Johnny Thunder's name through the mud and uh, at least uh, play out a story of the dynamics of having one of the superheroes, classic heroes, not being such a great guy and having a negative effect on a heroine. Also, the whole deal with the evil creepy Earth One Johnny Thunder in the hideous yellow and green costume that was used in the 80s story that split Black Canary into an unwitting mother and daughter. Legacy. Lots of implied perversion there. But instead of Static Shock being a fourth, they generated a fourth title within the first year of the Teen Titans series in Ravagers. And we have to take a minute and look at the Titans and what they mean to DC. Since the new Teen Titans, that line has been DC's equivalent to the X-Men. It's been one of their top selling teams. Arguably, the Justice League is the closest equivalent to X-Men because they've more consistently been top sellers for over the decades, but they've also had some fallow periods. And it's never as cool to be a Justice League member as it is to be a Titans member because they're the younger, fresher, more daring series. So, you know, Justice League has tended to outsell Teen Titans for a number of years, but that still has a cachet to it. But being DC's X-Men doesn't mean that you have this kind of faithful following that the X-Men have had. I mean, Marvel intentionally tried to cut the throat of the X-Men for a number of years because of uh, the, the intricacies of the Fox deal and Ike Perlmutter wanting to diminish them and raise up the humans as replacements and all this hubris all this false assumptions of what you could and could not do for a fandom to a fandom but despite the highs of the titans line it's always struggled to to be a franchise the way the x-men were a franchise there's rarely been a circumstance where the satellite titles could in any way compete with the core title and certainly that the titans uh, as a whole could compete sales wise with the x-men but that's never stopped dc from top trying and again you got these three core titles that they were trying their best to force you to follow. Mostly it was just going back and forth between Superboy and Teen Titans though. But then you had the launch of the Ravagers which was just this very peculiar thing. It was sort of like how do we do a cool version of Titans West? And part of that was I guess naming the team after Deathstroke's daughter. And I guess by extension is Dead Son. But eh, whatever. Nobody ever cared about Grant. So you've got the character Ravager Rose Wilson being an adversarial presence to a team of also Ravagers. And I think the Ravager was sort of an attempt at a generic term for the people that worked for Harvest uh, who was involved with all the culling and and messing around with the teen metahumans and coming back from the future, yada, yada, yada. But what it really represented, besides a quasi-Titans West, and not limited to bringing in the artist of, I think it was called Titans East, the one-shot special they they used to set up a new Titan series where they killed off a bunch of nobodies who were representing the Titans for that one-shot special. It was drawn by Ian Churchill, an artist that I always thought should have greater fame than he did have. He was one of those guys guys who Marvel built up in their X titles, specifically Cable, after the image exodus. And I thought he was very flashy and had a stronger anatomy than a lot of those guys. X-Force had been started by Rob Liefeld and continued by Greg Capullo. And to some degree, Iron Churchill felt like a combination of those two, but with a little bit of Jim Lee razzmatazz and again, a stronger command of anatomy, arguably than both of them. As Greg Capullo became more of a stylist over the course of his career and through the influence of Topic Farlane. Churchill had a nice run on Cable. He seemed like he was going somewhere. He got lured over to 
awesome by Rob Liefeld. And I think that's really what derailed his career because he did have more creative control. He was getting to write his own books. But the, the bloom was off the rose with regard to both Liefeld and the Image Experiment. Image was going to have to reinvent itself soon. And Liefeld wasn't even at Image anymore. He was off doing his little awesome project. A lot of good comics came out of that because in part they were throwing a lot of money around at a time where there wasn't a lot of money to be found in the industry post boom. But I don't think Iron Churchill's career ever came back from his sojourn to awesome. It probably would have been in his best interest to just stay at Marvel. And that's not fair. I, you know, go where the money is for starters. And of course, if you can do a creator own project, do so. But Churchill's big creator own project was The Coven. You probably don't remember that book ever existed. I mostly remember just because I liked Iron Churchill, but not because I actually read the book. I can't tell you if it's any good or not. I know that a lot of issues weren't produced and they're produced at Awesome where they probably would have had better sales elsewhere. And there were a lot of casualties of Marvel in that time period. Guys who did stay with Marvel like Ron Lim that could have had a better career and are now, I don't want to call him a footnote, but this guy was generating so much material for Marvel after the image exodus. He was like the image guy they went to that stuck with him that, and and I don't think that paid off for him necessarily. There's a guy who's drawing children's books now. Uh, there were there Marvel licensed children's books, I can say, and I'm hoping he's making decent money for that, but I doubt he ever made Image Comics founder money. Setting that aside though, you have this Ravager's book launch and it's written by Howard Mackey, who I think is a solid writer, but he never really recovered from his involvement in the clone saga of Spider-Man, even though I personally think that that the way that story arc was finally completed was about as best as you could do and you did get to make use out of Norman Osborn again although he did sort of become just a, another Lex Luthor clone but I think Mackie's a sl- solid writer uh, Ian Churchill I think is a pretty dynamic artist uh, you could see where a book like Ravagers could take off and it was interesting to me too because as a Wildstorm guy I liked that that was one of the books that had strong Wildstorm incorporation through the use of Fairchild a character who had been used extensively in those early Superboy issues. You also had Beast Boy, who was among the more popular of the new Teen Titans, although they made the potentially fatal error of making him red instead of green so that he wasn't quite recognizable and it really rubbed it in fans' faces that this was a starkly different version of the character that they had followed for years. So it, it made it easier to dismiss that the guy who was called Beast Boy didn't look like Beast Boy in this book. But it didn't help that you also had a Terra that didn't look or act like Terra. You had Thunder and Lightning, these characters Characters that are related to the Titans that have never had any kind of a following and are not even recognizable as individuals. They've ch- changed who those characters are so many times and that no, they have no identification factor. And in fact, associating with Thunder and Lightning will hurt your brand essentially. And then they had this new alien looking dude named Ridge. He wasn't an alien. He just was alien looking and he was a bruiser. So he didn't have a lot to offer that any other bruiser from any other team had. Uh, so despite having a decent creative team, team uh, a lot of potential there and having close association with the titans line it felt pretty disposable it didn't feel like these guys were ever going to be anything really noteworthy and it probably didn't help that there was a strong tna factor with the fair child character having a run around pretty much naked um that have probably turned off a section of the potential audience uh titans while not nearly as inclusive as legion of superheroes does thrive through inclusivity and so when you have sort of this tna book with some fairly white bread looking characters that are off model from their representation in Titans as a whole, you're essentially asking to be ignored. And Ravagers was another book that was ignored. Uh, Despite having much closer ties to the Titans books than Static Shock had had, sales weren't great and it was also an early cancellation. It got a full year plus. They had zero issues to 13 total. So that was certainly more successful than Static was. Frankly, uh, Ravagers could have used the Static in there. That probably would have helped them and Static, but that's not the way they went both properties suffered for it you also had another one of those Amanda Waller situations where they bring in a young hot able-bodied Niles Calder so I guess that's sort of like uh, hot Xavier they were trying to get all James McAvoy with it but when everybody's young and hot uh, they're indistinct you've got to have some old farts to be the old fart to make the young kids look good by comparison I guess also considering that so many of the people who read comic books these days are old farts we actually want a Niles Niles Calder and relate more to a Niles Calder than we would to hot Vogue Niles Calder. But certainly one of the things that hurt Ravagers was that it spun out of the Culling crossover. And so that was a good point to stop reading those titles. You know, <laughs> Titans Lost got canceled not too long after the crossover. So the embezzlement scam was already falling apart. And then you got the Ravagers where they 
don't have a crossover leading that they were leading into. They were coming out of it. And, you know, Titans fans are always wanting that spinoff. They're always talking up a Titans East or Titans West. It's never worked out in 60 fucking years. And it's funny because Ravagers was probably the closest to a viable take on that concept. But because it didn't feature any Titans that anybody cared about, which, let's be honest, there usually aren't enough spare Titans that anybody cares about to even bother to create a second team. But regardless of that, the people they specifically chose to be in the Ravengers were not people that Titans fan had any particular interest in. If you're a Titans fan, you've essentially got Beast Boy. And, I, I, you know, Beast Boy's not going to support his own team. You want him hanging out and goofing with Cyborg. You don't want him as uh, somebody on a whole separate group, especially one that's very Wildstorm flavored and New 52 flavored. And it probably also didn't help that Iron Churchill isn't great at meeting deadlines anymore. And he only did the first few issues. And then you ended up with a catch of the month. One of the things that helped propel Titans is that they consistently had like a murderer's row of artists. The book starts with... Brett Booth, and he continues to come back over and over again. You've got Ale Garza, who isn't necessarily a big name, but is definitely an artist with youth appeal and, you know, just aesthetically pleasing for a decent uh, amount of the audience. Uh, You've got Eddie Barrows, who I think is just a fantastic artist and has never gotten his due. He's always been in the shadow of of Ibon Reis. They definitely have strong similarities, and uh, probably Eddie Barrows owes a debt to the guy. And that just reminds me of the Continuity Studios days. You got a bunch of guys that drew a lot, like Neil Adams. Well, Neil Adams is one of the greatest artists to ever draw comic books. So if you draw pretty close to being Neil Adams with your own particular takes on that essential style, I'm, I'm kind of there for that. In fact, in general, I tend to prefer the guys that were influenced by Neil Adams as much or more than Neil Adams himself. Mark Beecham is sexy, porny Neil Adams. Mark Texera is wild, crazy, sinkevich Neil Adams. Sinkevich himself is a Neil Adams, started out as a Neil Adams clone, so he's artsy-fartsy Neil Adams, although Although, let's be honest, uh, by the time he got to the artsy-fartsy mode, you can no longer see any of the Neil Adams in his work. But getting ra- back to Ravagers, I-, I would say if you look at the book, it was always a consistently good-looking book. Uh, nobody knows Aguera, but I liked his stuff. He, I think, worked on some of the Stormwatch material back in the day. Not back in the day, let's be honest, back in the New 52 day. But I think he has an attractive style. But I think Ravagers definitely suffered for numerous creative changes. They had at least two distinct creative teams over the course of its life, probably arguably more like three and we're talking about a 13 issue series and simply put this is a book about characters that most people don't care about you know with the exception of Fairchild and I think that Fairchild outside of Gen 13 has a very limited appeal I think visually she's an interesting looking character but I mean let's just be honest here Gen 13 a lot of the reason why that book was popular was because of a specific artist drawing those characters in a specific style the book's never been able to reclaim the highs of that period a lot of people were really love the the run that Adam Warren did writing the book with Ed Bennis and Ed Bennis uh, has a similar appeal to J. J. Scott Campbell without ever quite reaching those heights. But I do think the Gen 13 characters are mediums for the art style to a larger degree they're, or they're mediums to a vibe. You read Gen 13 not necessarily because you are a huge fan of any particular character in the book but because of the vibe of the book and the look of the book. And truth to tell, at the end of the day Fairchild is essentially uh, a less charismatic She-Hulk. She's a bit more of a brain than she hulk i think that's a good fit for the dc universe i think she would be a good fit for a variety of teams but i don't think she's a character who could carry a book and that's essentially what ravagers was asking her to do and as a result of that ask uh, the entire team appeared to be slain by deathstroke the terminator at the end of the series uh that was retconned uh, later on but i'm not particularly fluent in german and uh, i'm not sober either so those are two marks against my ability to say this word but there was an element of schadenfreude by the end of that series where it's just like okay fuck it let's just kill them all and somebody else can sort it out later i guess my point is that the new 52 line needed to do a better job of supporting each individual title and having more overlap and it's a shame that they managed to produce 13 issues of ravagers and all it really did was set up the return of beast boy to the titans line where frankly he should have been in the first place (laughs) 
you get me on my knees. Well, please, baby, please, listen. She looks so great. Every time I see her face, she put me in a state, a state of shock. Alan Richard Jones, Artificial Twins, B. Bally, Canoes, Chris Dunford, Chris Lytton, Chris Thompson, Dave's Comic Heroes blog, Dear Watchers, a Comics Omnivers podcast, Del Dracula, Dr. Ange, Doc Strange, Dear Ashton, Ed Moore, El Romero Mero, The Hammer Strikes, Random Jeeky Stuff, History of Comics on Film, Honorable Justin, Iowa's Joe is, Jan Sipkorver, Jeffrey Brown, JMT Prod, John Kiala Mullinge, John from Married Watching Cartoons Podcast, KSCGSF Podcast, Lucretia, Martin Gray, Mike It's and Aliens to Me, Man, Miracle Man aka Old Man Kimoda, Randy Caldwell, Raven X Fields, Resurrections, and Adam Warlick and Thanos Podcast, Richard Field, Ronald Clark, Sean Phillips, Siskoid, Spaterno Vilches, Star Rocket Radio, Talk Nerdy to Me, Tasmia Mahler, Tim Price, The Pod Crasher, Timothy Deers, Tara, Ward Hill Terry, Wayne Burroughs, and Wibbly Wobbly Dicey Wicey RPG Podcast, On WordPress, Sebastian Liked Our Post, On Vol X, Star Rocket Radio Tweeted, You guys are pretty damn special yourselves, thanks for the mention, Canoes Tweeted, Looking forward to listening to this later on, thanks, Chuck Coletta Tweeted, Instead of another encyclopedia, I'd prefer a return of Who's Who, Too Expensive and Labor Intensive for Too Small a remaining audience. Not going to happen. Sorry, Del Dracula asked. Ravagers versus Ravers. Who wins? Finally, I'll say Dano tweeted. Oh God, the culling. Thanks for the flashbacks. The preceding program is a non-profit fan production. Any copyrighted materials contained therein are believed borrowed under fair use with no copyright infringement intended. Please feel free to leave comments at Rolled Spine's Productions WordPress blog. You can also send us Twitter comments through the Rolled Spine Podcast Twitter. Thank you for listening. (laughs) 